even taking on roles like that, you, you have to, you have to say to yourself, you know, if I don't do it, who's going to do it? Yeah, we don't good. want actual evil people in these roles. Hi, and welcome to the Story of Podcast, where storytellers disrupt. I'm David Neronia. And I am Fabiano Altamora. He said it normal this time, which well, also always there was a pause. There was definitely a pregnant me. pause in between first yeah, and last I'm so name. glad you dressed up for this episode. It's Thank showing you. off the knees. Dude, and- it's, th- it's, it's 33 degrees Celsius outside, bro. It's hot. No American knows what you just said. They well, just think you're selling product placement for Celsius. Angus does. We've got a cool Aussie. But before uh, before we dive in with our two amazing guests who you're hearing just off camera, uh, we just want to welcome you to like, subscribe, follow, give us that comment, that five-star review, share it with a friend. Brother, who do we have in the hot seat for our very special second episode with these guests? Yeah, I'm really excited today because we're doing a bit of a reverse this time yes, because um, our two friends, Kendall Bryan and Angus Benfield, they have a movie they're about to release. Yes, sir, yeah. So we're going to go a little bit backwards. It's going to be kind of like episode two. Then we're going to go like to episode J. J. one and do the origin yeah. story of how you guys met and how you both got into filmmaking. But before we get into it, I'm just going to do a brief bio on Kendall Bryant and we call him Kenny or I call him Kevin and Angus. So Kendall Bryant Jr. first discovered acting during grade school and his passion for storytelling continued throughout high school. After working with multiple media companies, he co-founded Cares to Love Productions, which has produced internationally distributed and award-winning short films, documentaries, and web series. More recently, he has partnered with Llama Entertainment to produce multiple feature films to include Yellowbird and The Great Turkey Town Miracle. He also co-directed The Keeper and directed The Deep Programmer and Stan the Man, all releasing in the near future. And that's Kenny... And then Angus, Angus's resume, just before we get into it, is like longer than both my arms put together. And, and your I think we could continue. And my arms are long. Very long. Um, but like, I'm going to do a brief version yeah. of it because he's probably worked with every single name in the industry and written and produced insane amounts of film. So Angus Benfield, executive, founder and CEO, actor, producer and director, is an Australian-born, LA-based, multi-award-winning director, producer, actor and writer and is the founder and CEO of LA-based film production and distribution company, Lum Entertainment and production company, Bridge and Acorn Entertainment. Movies have been a lifelong passion for Angus, starting in the industry as a production run at the age of 14. Mm-hmm. He late, he later went on to train as an actor at the Actors Centre and at 20 landed the lead role in the Australian feature film Lex and Rory, straight out of acting school. Angus is an accomplished actor and has worked with some of the biggest names in Hollywood, including Chevy Chase, Randy Quaid, Eric Roberts, Julia Gardner, Judy Norton, LL Cool J, hey. Kate Blanchett, another fellow Aussie. And the list goes on and on wow. and on and on. And you've got about 22 movies in production right now, which is insane. Yeah. So Welcome. well done, guys. It's an honor to have you both on Kenny. And that being... pretty much concludes our first episode. That 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 was <laughs> Well, here's a funny thing. Obviously, Kenny being one of our best mates, but like it's so funny how this world kind of intertwines. So I cast Kenny in Buying Her, Benji Nolo, one of Benji Nolo's movies. This is going to sound exceptionally controversial. I meet Angus as a guy that's raping my daughter in this movie. You, Which sounds heavily controversial. So context, I'm going to offer context. Just- Angus was playing the role. <laughs> Angus was playing the role of a guy that has now, thank, thank goodness, been re- redeemed. And this yeah. movie is about human trafficking. So anyway, then Angus and Kenny connect, and now you start this beautiful, beautiful kind of production relationship. And then Angus stole Travis Huff from me. And no one, uh, I, I, you're going to also have to give context for yeah, that. Yeah, so Travis Because we're going to think it's a strange Aussie. Yes, you know, is, a tra- is, it's like is a, a Hollywood veteran yeah. who was my executive assistant for a couple of years. And now he's 
he's been working in the movies for so many many years. But I, I say Ben Ginolo and Angus Benefield both stole Travis Huff from me. So and with that, gentlemen, welcome to the story <laughs> of podcast, the story of podcast. Where we occasionally let our guests speak. I'm so sorry. sorry. <laughs> 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 So, hey, gentlemen, I- it's so good to see you again, Kenny. Um, g- gentlemen, uh, coming to you, Kenny, first, how did you meet this this strapping buck of a Nazi there to your left on my screen? How did you guys connect and decide to take this co-production leap of faith, man? Hey, real quick, I just want to say that if it wasn't for these two men right here, David and Fab, I wouldn't even be in filmmaking. Wow. And so they were more than instrumental on my journey. And so I just want to throw that out there before I get started. Love you, bro. Thanks, Thank bro. you, man. Love you, bro. I was actually on the same film as uh, Angus. Um, I was actually, uh, I got the credit of sex buyer number one. <laughs> <laughs> Were, weren't you like, just, just like in boxers or something, Kenny? <laughs> oh, exactly. Lord. <laughs> but, but what's funny, you know, that film was a documentary with a, a lot of reenactments. And, uh, I, I think me and Angus both have talked about this, you know, even, even taking on roles like that, you, you have to, you have to say to yourself, you know, if I don't do it, who's going to do it? Yeah, we don't good. want actual <laughs> evil people in these roles. And, and you have to have, uh, you know, you have to have the bad guys. You have to have the villains. You have to have the story. You have to have the conflict, the pluses to minuses and minuses to pluses as David taught me. And um, so, you know, it, it does take a lot for actors to decide, you know, what roles they're going to take and um, lots of prayer, obviously. But if I hadn't taken that role, I would have met Angus. And that's how we first started talking about doing feature films together. It's so funny because that reminds me of what David Oyelowo said when he was, you know, kind of invited to be on a film that maybe he had questions about, but yeah. it was actually the Lord's hand that actually led him to take a role that, I mean, I think many in the church would say, Hey, why are you doing that thing? And yet there were godly purposes in this particular case with the other story. It was a salvation that took on set and an introduction to Jesus. Yeah. You know, we had David Pileggi say a very similar thing. So yeah. why, why are you on this set? Why are you on that set? He had the most beautiful simple response he said souls yeah um angus sir uh let, let's talk a little bit about this film you you guys have a film that's about to premiere tell us a little bit about about it the keeper yes yeah. yeah, sir yeah this is um yeah obviously it's a true story about uh george echelon who uh did a through hike on the appalachian trail carrying the name tapes of 363 veterans who had all committed suicide. And um, so we're, you know, this was something that really did happen. And, uh, and he really did do this through hike multiple times. It's hard because I don't want to give too much away of, sure. of mm-hmm. what sort of happens. Is It's not, although it's not really a twist thriller or anything else like that, but there is some pretty poignant moments that we don't want to sort of give away too much. But um, yeah. And so, and then um, Todd who was one of the writers who, picked up George's story and, and turned it into a screenplay. And uh, yeah, it was, I mean, I just discovered this script on ink tip, which is just a platform that writers can put their scripts on. Um, and there's like thousands, thousands of scripts. And I went through there and I found quite a few scripts actually. And then, but this is the one that, you know, really stood out. And um, I was amazed that no one had made it. And, um, and that's sort of how we discovered it. And uh, yeah. And the story is uh, yeah, really about, um, you know, George's life going in this transformation of, of this journey on the trail, which is sort of why people, it, there's a kind of a spiritual aspect to the Appalachian Trail. Um, I think, you know, that hiking process is something very cathartic to sort of work mm-hmm. through a lot of things. Um, yeah. And really, I mean, we wanted to k- keep the film pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, we, we weren't looking for, you know, I mean, although there were some plot twists and stuff like that in it, but it's a really sort of, real like linear story of just mm-hmm. what, you know, someone going on this journey. So the Odyssey sort of storytelling where there's like every single stage, there's something new, there's a different person. And all of these, all these events are exactly what happened to George. And we also went to the eg- exact places, mm. the, on the trail, on the, the, site, the hostels, everything was exactly where he went um, on the trail. So uh, yeah. And we just wanted to keep it really authentic and really real. And, um, show that story and then in the process of doing that um raise awareness to the 22 veterans who commit suicide every day and um that's what we hope this story does and that's yeah 
Wow. I appreciate that. My son and I, we just saw Bob Marley's story, One Love, that I was really, really excited to see. And and I don't, I don't want to knock it too hard, but one of the things that kind of bummed me out was that I just think Bob Marley's story, just the simple story of his life is mm-hmm. is just so powerful. And they got all fancy pants and they did all this time hopping to, to the point that my son and I sat there and, and went... I don't know if that woman is his wife mm. or his sister or a backup singer. Like, that's how confused I got. Oh, really? And I consider myself, you know, I mean, I've, I've watched a ton of movies. I teach on it. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on right now. I feel mm. dumb. So I appreciate, Angus, to your point that you wanted to tell the story just straight up, man. Mm. And just keep it simple. Yep. Um, yeah. Kenny, I would we'd be neglectful to, to not mention the fact, sir, that you served this country. And I got to wonder... What attracted you to to co-producing this and, and partnering up with Angus on this film? Yeah, um, yeah, I served in the Marine Corps and I'm a combat veteran. I uh, fought in the Persian Gulf War, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and uh, yeah, right when he mentioned it, I was like, "This is a yeah, it's right down my alley." I understand what military guys go through. I've been through my own PTSD. What I thought was just right after the war, I went through serious PTSD and then it slowly seemed to get better. But I've actually, this film has put me on a journey wow. back on uh, to my mental health journey. And, um, you know, Angus saw me, you know, even while we were filming, some of the scenes were really hitting me hard. Um, and I was getting very emotional and I'd been on this journey of reconnecting with a lot of my Marine Corps friends. And, and so um since then i've uh connected with the va they've gotten me help Mm. and i'm i'm actually talking to a psychologist every once a month and um the reason why i bring this up is because i was one of those you know our grandfather's generation and our dad mom and dad's generations just stuffed this kind of stuff yeah and for me i think i did the same thing i always had that attitude of Oh, I've got it under control. I've taken care of it. I've been to counseling for this stuff. But, um, you know, what I would really encourage uh, people my age and older is it's okay. It's okay to admit that you need help. It's okay to go and talk about it. I think that's really what me and Angus were trying to do with this film is is get people just to talk to one another, to tell their story. Because a lot of times that's all it takes for you to be understood and not to, to bury that stuff. And then it come out in a very negative way and and it could be ultimately suicide as it happens. So, so many times. And so, yeah, um, this is very personal movie for me and has become even more personal as I've gone. Um, yeah, it's just really set me on a journey. That's good. And my wife notices the difference. So, so maybe, you come on as a producer and co-director and the next thing you know, you're on a mental health journey. Yeah. And that's exactly what we intended this film to do. That's amazing. And, and Angus, you play the lead in this movie. How was that experience for you? Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, yeah, it's, it, it was, again, it's like, you know, what Kenny's saying, like, I think we all were sort of going through an emotional sort of journey because we shot it in such a linear way. We started mm-hmm. and although the first day was pretty hectic, <laughs> pretty full on we started you know but but there was that kind of really nice process of getting deeper and deeper into it mm. and the the burden and the emotional so everything was starting to kind of rise more and more towards the end and so i i you know obviously uh, something that what really drew drew to me is even though i haven't got any military background because i couldn't handle that i couldn't yeah. handle being yelled at and, and tense <laughs> and anything i'm i'm too much of a wuss but um but i understand but i wonder one thing i can relate to is a lot of the mental health stuff and the, and the anxiety and depression and stuff when we first met like um george uh, uh kenny and, and todd and i we all got together and did a little promo video before we even shot the film and and it was like that's when i started talking with george and, and we just and we really connected then because we could connect on those issues of of mental health and, 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 and the desire to raise awareness to that, especially for, for men as well, because it's hard for men a lot of times to express and themselves. And, and of course, veterans is even harder. You got mm-hmm. the whole other layer of, you know, just you, you're being trained to, to fight. So what the last, last thing you're going to do. So, so for me, like that's what I could connect to. Mm-hmm. And then, um, so 
I felt like that sort of side of things was kind of something that I, I have experience with that I could kind of go through. But then carrying the pack and then the name tapes, that was a really heavier, that's wow. a whole other level. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like you've got the personal stuff, which as an actor, and you guys obviously know, you know, you can, you can pull on anything really. Yeah. But, but then when you get the real pack that, that George hiked with and then oh. the, the actual. So it was, it, it was the actual, these weren't props. Yeah. These were, oh my no, gosh. No. It was the real thing. Because it stank of cigarettes, and we had to put it in the garage. Because it was as my character does, and it, it, we opened it up. So, oh my god! So it was definitely authentic. That's for wow. sure. Yeah. And um, but but yeah, and the name tapes. But we had those name tapes uh, tapes for um, because George, when we first met, he gave them to me. So it was several months, and you know, we we laid them out. We wanted to look at see the see the, the scope of this all. Mm. But I could feel that. I could feel that, and to this mm. day, I still feel that weight and carrying that every day was just like and sometimes you get disconnected when you're making a film because there's mm-hmm. all this other crap that you have to do with all the time yeah. and it's money and it's this and that and every now and then you it, it would just every throughout the day you just suddenly realize oh my gosh these are real people yeah and then and then it was that 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 weight is just yeah it was quite immense and then i definitely really it kind of yeah. I mean, it's kind of mind blowing right. that they had the actual thing, you know, I mean, the yeah. acting technique, I don't know what you, what you call it, but you know, imbuement, you know, uh, endowment, 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 right. Yeah. Or when you imbue or endow, there's this process that an actor has to go through mm-hmm. where let's say there's a book, a journal, a photo, any, any particular mm-hmm. prop that's in a, in a, in a, in a story, in a play and actors actually used to have, it, it takes them weeks to personalize these objects so when they mm-hmm. interact with them in a play or a movie it has some sense of significance particularization yeah. right and mm-hmm. people don't think that it actually makes a difference but angus just highlighted something because he had actual physical mm-hmm. procs to carry the the weight of the thing you know i mean we're not going to get into you know kind of crazy theological studies but yeah. I really do believe that I don't know if it's just emotional significance yeah. that we recognize or an actual thing that it's, happens. It's literally the, the weight of it. No pun intended. You know, it's a backpack, but it feels like the weight of it. But like this is so this this film's a true story. You got to met you got to meet the guy. How was that for you, Angus? Like, you know, because sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, like we have biopics like Elvis and we feel that we have to try and bring in some similarity and we transform ourselves is 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 that a process you went through to try and mimic kim or no, no. yeah no i i, I think it's because it's, it's interesting because george was with me the whole time so wow. it's kind of like you know um which could have been really bad but it was actually really it was really nice to have him there because he was so supportive and mm-hmm. he was so encouraging and he wasn't mm. you know nitpicking everything yeah uh, wasn't like I was trying to, you know, because that, that would that would completely throw me out if it was like that. So he was really yeah. good. So, but I I found like instead of trying to be like mimic or copy him, I, mm-hmm. I just had to find the cadence of yep. his kind of rhythms and stuff. Yeah, because there's so much else going on. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I really wanted to most the most important thing for me is just the, the authenticity mm-hmm. of a, of this car of of this version of George. I guess the keeper to part two kind of thing like his version my version of him is like i wanted to be just grounded in those sort of uh, authenticity and the emotional kind of mm-hmm. world as opposed to all these other areas um and then yeah so it was just i just found certain phrases and certain tones and and then and, and tweaking the accent a bit more and that's i i felt like that's why well, i just wanted to stay there and that mm-hmm. was it otherwise if i start trying to do more and more and more then it's just the wheels will fall off and too much and i and and yeah so that's that's what i did i mean physically we're sort of not too far apart so it was kind of you know there was some some similarities and it was just yeah and the sort of elements and the humor and stuff so it was a little bit easier because i felt i related to george well i felt like i was very similar to him you know except for different backgrounds but there was we kind of connected so i i'm not one in the, I don't really do this kind of full on method and full on f- thing because the bandwidth is so like when you're directing, producing, you're doing all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I mean, the last, last film I did, like the director's like, Oh, can you keep an American accent the whole time? Cause he was Australian. He can pick up my Australian accent through American accent. And I'm like, well, I'm producing this. I can't have meetings. You know, it's like, I can't do that. It's like, I'll, Oh, she wanted you to yeah. not not just on camera as the character, but just all yeah. the time. She wanted you to be it. Wow, that that, that can yeah, be stressful. Yeah. 
that's yeah, no, it's that's like, funny. I, I was like, that's just silly. And, <laughs> and it, <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Anyway, but that's yeah. and it's got to be hard as well. I mean, it's amazing that you have somebody like because you you both co-directed. It was a co-direct this film, right? Mm. So Angus, for you with having Kenny there, Kenny, was this your first co-direct yeah. in a feature this film? My first feature film uh directing yeah, and in this case co-directing and how did how did you find that obviously having somebody as experienced as angus to, to lean back on how did you find that experience uh fantastic probably the best opportunity i could have ever had was uh working with angus um i definitely had some imposter syndrome on the first couple of days <laughs> and uh but i think i settled in uh mm. eventually and Angus is easy to direct. He always just gives you a ton, nails it. Um, you know, every time if we had anything to discuss, we just discuss it. Um, and um, really, it was more story points to make sure we were getting our story right. Um, for me, it, it was about the genuineness of the military characters because yeah. there's a lot of military characters in the film, and there's a lot of banter back and forth mm -hmm. with them in the film. And making sure that it was genuine and that the actors understood why yeah. it happens and how it happens. And um, so it's really their relationships with each other and with Angus's character. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I contributed. Um, but yeah, Angus, you know, we we were set up to where Angus could look at the screen at any time. Yeah. So even when he was in front of the camera, he could always see the shot, always see the scene. So anything he was concerned about, he could just bring it up right then and there. And we would adjust quickly. We had to adjust quickly. We shot it out very fast. Well, how long did it take to film it? How many, pro how many production days, Angus? I think it was about 15. Oh yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's that's, quick, that's especially, aggressive. Yeah. Especially when you both have multiple roles. Cause I know Kenny, you were in it, Angus, you were co-directing it, producing it and the lead actor. I mean, that's got to, that's got to take a, a toll. I mean, did that in any way um, lessen your ability to focus fully on the character with it being such a heavy story that you both wanted to tell? And like you said, you know, you were doing the movie, Kenny, you, you were co-directing it and getting really affected by the movie. Angus, obviously you're carrying the whole film. So there's a, a huge burden on any lead actor carrying a movie there's a lot of weight on that how do you how do you compartmentalize for both of you i guess this is to both of you compartmentalize those different roles when being a lead actor is a burden enough that it is let alone co-directing and producing it sometimes i mean it was really good, helpful that's why i i need oh i i didn't just want i needed a co-director i needed kenny to be be there and i felt like as we kind of got further into it and the emotional elements got more intense i, I felt you know it's nice to sort of i just let yeah. kenny sort of take over more and more and more so I, at the beginning i kind of probably carried a little bit more of the weight just to get going yeah and, and it was nice that we, then i was kind of getting to a point where i was starting to uh, you know my, yeah, my bandwidth was getting, <laughs> was getting too much sure. because it is very tiring i think the producing aspect is the most tiring and yeah you, you do have to compile compartialize sometimes it can help too because i do have a lot of anxiety and i i you know like kenny talks about imposter syndrome it's like i have all those things and you know from imposter syndrome anxieties <laughs> and all those things and I, I i i struggle with confidence and you name it so sometimes mm. being busy is good than sitting in a like a, <laughs> a, a trailer waiting for you you know i remember doing some TV show in, here when I got to LA and I'm sitting in the trailer, my heart's racing. I see the little lapel mic on my shirt bouncing up and down. I'm like, so, so sometimes being busy is good, but then it, and then that's great because it's burning up all that energy and then you're ready to go. So you're not overthinking. Cause I think that's my problem. If I overthink, it's just terrible. But then the downside of that is then it gets too much. And I felt like, by the time we got to day one, was, I was so exhausted because we did all the location scouting on the day before and the travel. And then it was all those weeks and months of prep. So it's got pros and cons. So I, I wouldn't advise it to everybody, but it's uh, sometimes it works in my favor and mm -hmm. sometimes it doesn't. But it was very helpful to have Kenny to sort of help, <laughs> help carry the load, basically. You know, I, I love about what Angus and Kenny both said, mm -hmm. you know, no matter how accomplished they are or whatever, that imposter syndrome, I don't know if it ever goes, mm. right? I mean, you guys have been working in the industry now for a long time. And I, I love the fact as mm. well 
relationship is such a key component that like for us, for example, right? If there's one area of our business that I'm not good at, you pick up the slack. Like with you guys, it's so important, especially as vulnerable as you are as creators and as performers, you need that other person to lean back on that you can trust. And I think that's amazing for what you guys have. So listen, where can we see the keeper? It's, it's major theatrical release, right? Yeah. Yeah. But sort of, it's a bit of an uphill battle because I mean, again, it's a very small film with big stars and we're up against. So we're releasing Memorial weekend weekend, which is also where, you know, there's another Mad Max thing. There's another, there's all these bigger, bigger films. So we're literally like David versus 10 Goliaths. And uh, so we have, um, so what we're doing is we have a, a, like a special preview premiere screening that happens on the 15th of this month. And it's going to be like, uh, like doing a, a sort of a satellite stream where we do a Q and a and an introduction at a, a, at the Palo Vista in LA. And then that goes to several cinema theaters across the country i think i can't remember how many we've got now but um it's on it's on the website right sorry i think it's 18 great yeah yeah and and then we have a couple of regal theaters picking it up on from the 22nd does it start yeah and then so then we start to roll out and then there's a few other smaller theaters coming on board and so really if you if you go to the website you can we'll, we'll, we'll keep updating the screening uh, sessions and stuff, but we're, we're sort of probably going to have to release a couple of like after the memorial weekend, because we just can't fit in yep. to those um, cinemas, which is really frustrating, but that's just the way it is. So the idea is we want to just keep pushing it, you know, kind of keep rolling it out. We feel like the theatrical experience is a very important mm. experience for this film. So there's that sense of community because I mean, it's still going to be great once it goes to streaming, because we hope that someone st- struggling can watch it three Absolutely. in the morning or something and, and, and get, you know, and it helps them. But I do feel like the theatrical experience is a great opportunity to bring somebody who you might feel is struggling or something. And then there's, a, it's, it's a safe place where you watch a film and you can discuss it afterwards. So, so we're, we're, we're going to, we're, we're coming out, you know, on the 15th and then again on the Memorial Day weekend. And then we'll just keep pushing it and other theaters will start picking it up. We hope to do a bit of a slow, gradual theatrical release across the country. We have, um, other screenings that will be happening at military bases. We're talking Great. to the Navy at the moment in Washington, D.C., all these kind of things. So you've got to go through, as Kenny knows about <laughs> military red tape. There's a lot of that, but we're getting, we're slowly, we're just going to keep pushing it, you know, and then that's what we'll, we'll do. But um, yeah, so if you go to the website, you can find out more information. But, yeah. Gentlemen, um, you know, Angus, I know you mentioned before we, before we land this one with you guys on the movie premiere, you mentioned statistics around mental health for our service men and women. What do we need to know is happening every day that we might not know? Well, yeah, I mean, the statistics of 22 uh, veterans are committing suicide on average every day. Gosh. So in the movie, the 363 name tapes represent 16 and a half days. And that's it. And then, and then, so today there was 22 committed suicide tomorrow will be 22, you know, and, um, and yeah, and it's hard because even in the film in George's character talks about trying to raise awareness, but then feels like, I don't even know if that's working. And, and it's, it's one of those things that to put your finger on it is a very tricky thing. I, I think, and that's the only thing we have, like Kenny's talking about even going through the film started to kind of help him. Right. It does kind of make you aware of like, maybe I'm not okay. Hmm. Because sometimes we don't even realize we're not sure. okay because we're, sure. we all wear masks and we all say, Hey, again, I'm going, I'm doing well. Everyone's happy. And then you wonder why you feel the way you do. So, so it's, so the statistics of that way, uh, that way I believe is because people don't know what to do. There's no, there's no, there's nowhere to go. So it's like the world is, so much overstimulation, so much stuff going in on, you know, the mint. I mean, I think, think because of social media now, it's like for young people as well, like the, the, the decline in mental health is like, I think they did statistics like back in the in 1950s would be considered, um, they would have been, uh, put into a sanitarium if for on average per young person. So they're going through so much stress, anxiety, mm. fear and everything else, but it's now considered normal. So the new normal is not really. Is that mental health is degraded, Kenny? Uh, from your perspective as as a military man, if 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 I've got a friend, uh, a family member that is serving or has served, what advice do you give them? 
um, it's okay to not be okay. <laughs> you don't have to stuff it down. Um, like Angus said, we're, we're trained to be warriors and sometimes we take that far past the battlefield mm. and, and it, it becomes a detriment, um, instead of a help. And so sometimes you got to set that gun down and be vulnerable. Um, and yeah, um, one statistic I'd like to mention is, is suicide amongst veterans is 72% higher than amongst civilians. Mm. And so I just say to my brothers and sisters, both in the military now and the veterans that have gotten out, it's okay to talk about it. Mm. Find somebody you can trust and talk about it. There's tons of resources out there. The VA has a hotline. They have a crisis line. Uh, call it. All this is easy to find, too. You just type in veteran suicide and, and tons of websites pop up. So whatever one that you would... um that you're drawn to just call it, mm. just do it. Uh, we need you here. We need every single person here on this earth. You, every single one of you has something to contribute to this world. Mm. That's amazing. Well, guys, thank you for, thank you for making this film and thank you for, um, taking the risk to make something with such, you know, weighty content and, um, we can't wait to see it. So yeah, thank and we you believe so much, that lives guys. will be saved and yeah. people will reach out for help. Yeah. And, and and I know it's going to be more than one, but even if you just accomplish that one time, it'd be a miracle in and yeah. of itself. And I think it's going to be a hundredfold that. So gentlemen, we wish you well. Uh, guys, if you're looking to see the film, it's in a theater near you, streamer near you. Um, just look on our social medias, Angus's and Kenny's, and we'll make sure that we point you in the right direction. Gentlemen, thanks again for being on and thanks for checking out Story of Podcast. Thank you. See you next time.